Funding for the interview show is provided by LifeWay Foods, makers of LifeWay kefir and other probiotic products like their kefir cups, farmer cheese, and supplements. LifeWay, love your guts. Learn more at LifeWayFoods.com. It's impossible to quickly describe Eve Ewing. She's a poet, a sociologist. She writes comic books. Here we talk about Eve's book, Ghosts in the Schoolyard, about CPS's recent school closings. Well, let's talk about uh, your book about the school yeah. cl closings. Yeah. Um, and I think what, I don't wanna, I, you can't sum up the book in one sentence, but one sentence that you had in there that has stuck with me since reading it is this cycle, or not even a cycle, but a, a kind of a, a terrible legacy in Chicago of, and elsewhere, mm -hmm. of fencing black people in, mm -hmm. and then after you've done that for a long time, through different kinds of laws and covenants and just codes of behavior, mm -hmm. then then you force them out. Right. So it's fencing them in and then forcing them out. Right. So correct. Right. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. I, thank yes. you. Been reading comprehension yeah, by yes. Mark. Um, but I guess my 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 question there is: so you get to this point where the mayor and some other people say, "Look, we got a budget shortfall. Yeah. We've got these areas where there's." There's no, there's not no kids, but there's a dwindling amount of kids right. because of what's happened, because there were high rises and projects in Chicago that were torn down and people were sent packing. Yep. Um, but you've left in the wake, and what they people didn't seem to understand was that there were real communities that had grown up in these areas because you had fenced people in, and even if you had forced people out, there was still this community that was full of love, full of education, full of all kinds of things. And nobody ever looked at the big picture when it happened. So, so how do you say to people, how do you convey that these, these things that aren't as tangible as test scores, how do you, or, or numbers on a, on a sheet of how many kids are enrolling, like how, how would you go about saying, look at Mr. Mayor, you don't understand. So the reason I set out doing this project was because um, the narrative that I saw in the newspaper and from the school district about why schools were being closed did not match my understanding of empirical reality. It had no acknowledgement of any kind of social or historical context. It was like, black people just left the South Side and the West Side. We don't know why, but now the schools are empty, right? And what you're talking about that I kind of try to spell out in the book, which is the history of segregation and the relationship between housing policy and public housing and public schools, all those were things that um, people in communities knew and historians knew, but th that was never part of the policy conversation. And so. The first thing I think is important is doing exactly what you're talking about, which is just acknowledging history, right? Acknowledging that these things happen. And then that's a way in which I feel like Chicago mirrors America. America is very bad at talking about painful, hurtful things that have happened. Um, my thing is, uh, you know, all of the work that I do is, is partially about trying to reframe our conversation to say, this is a country that was founded on a history of chattel slavery and, and the genocide of indigenous peoples. That is a fact. Those are like incontrovert. That's not like my opinion, right? That is a, those are empirical facts. How do we proceed from there? How do we proceed from the fact that this country rounded up native children and sent them to boarding schools? And that's part of the history of what schools are, is a place where you have your culture stripped from you. How do we encounter the fact that, you know, Japanese American people were taken and put in internment camps and all their property seized, right? These are parts of our history, these are ugly parts of our history, but we can't proceed from a place of honesty until we talk about them. And so I think Chicago, um, you know, we might like to think of ourselves as some kind of like liberal bastion of goodness, um, but we have the same problem, and that problem is ahistoricity. It's an unwillingness to face the ugly parts of the past. An essential question is, what do you do? Like, how do you... Me personally? No, not you. Oh. I mean, it's just what, do, what does one do to... Let's acknowledge, and let's say, let's, let's... You know the best way, I think, to show... To, to show the powers that be what happens in a school would be to show them your poetry, to show them oh, a poem like... What, there was a poem in your book... I think it's called like Requiem for yeah, Fifth Period. Yeah. And it's a beautiful snapshot of the both joy and real kind of pain and isolation that comes with a day in a, in a city school. Um, and that might be a way to get people to, to understand. But at the same time, and this is me from the outside. Yeah, yeah. I mean, look at, look at me. I'm from the, you know, I'm not, I, I did not grow up in Englewood. There, or Bronzeville, where the, school, the, the schools that you write about are. Mm -hmm. And that is, if you're the mayor 
and you say, we still need to prepare children for college, for scholarships, for jobs, and we also, we understand the history, mm -hmm. we have this crazy state, and we've screwed people over, but we have a problem, we don't have money, and we have these schools where there are fewer kids for reasons that, hey, we didn't do it, yeah. you know. What do you do? What do you do? Um, so first is the, is the idea of we don't have money. Money is a funny thing. Uh, George Lucas, who I don't believe is in attendance this evening. No. Okay. He couldn't make it. We've tried. I know. Uh, George Lucas and Melody Hobson gave $25 million to After School Matters. Um, which is a program that employs young people in Chicago in public schools. It was my, my first job, it's After School Matters. Uh, it was called Gallery 37 back then. They gave the same $25 million to the University of Chicago Lab School to build the Gordon Parks Art Emporium, I don't know, building. Um, so there's $25 million for the kids at the private school, and there's $25 million for every kid in Chicago that needs a job. Uh, money is a funny thing because when you decide that something is a priority, you find the money for it. Uh, the, the last round of school closures uh, in February, um, in which the Englewood, four Englewood schools are closed, they're being consolidated into a new school that's going to take $85 million of investment. Northside College Preparatory, where I went to high school, cost $44 million to make, to build, at a time when people in Little Village were, also, were on a hunger strike to try to get any school, period. These are all examples of times when, as people do in a capitalist society, enormous amounts of money are raised for things when those things are deemed as important. You're right. We, we say that these schools don't have resources, and the people who say that are the people who are the dole people out the resources. Are the people who That's what I'm saying. I'm like, do I live in crazy town? It's your job to give up. It's like if I told a room full of kids, you don't get to have a pencil, I'm like, you get a demerit because you don't have any I took the pencils. It's my job. It's crazy. Anyway, uh, so... I feel like part of it is, if my thing is, I feel like if we as a city said, this is a state of emergency, I feel like we need to decide that this is our priority. And by we, I mean people in power and not just people on the ground who actually have done an amazing job of, of leading grassroots efforts at these things. Now, the only other thing I'll say is that um, I think there's an assumption sometimes that people do uh, racist or hurtful or neglectful things out of ignorance. And I most of the time don't think that's true. I think that there's a pool of people that do things because they don't know any better. And I think there's another pool of people that's probably much larger that do things because they actually have a material investment in maintaining things the way they are. Um, and so... But hold on. You also, in, your, in the book, you say it doesn't matter. It's irrelevant whether the mayor is racist or BBB, who's you know black, is and she's like, I'm not racist. I'm, right. You know, um, it's irrelevant. And you do the book does I think the best job I've seen of succinctly explaining what systemic racism is versus individual racism. Right, racism so in you, my heart. Can you right. can you repeat Thank that you. here verbatim? Yes, yes, absolutely. <laughs> Uh, so, so people tend to think about racism in common terms uh, as something that lives within you as an individual. So people say things like, I don't have a racist bone in my body, right? I don't have any racism in my heart. Racism is not like a buildup of cholesterol in your arteries, right? It's not, it's not something that lives within you. Racism, because we live in a racist society, which means a society that is predicated upon a racial heart hierarchy, right? Our entire, the entirety of American society was constructed that way. Everything from our legal system to the way our residential housing is set up to the way our educational system is set up was predicated upon the, those presumptions that we have to distinguish people in racial hierarchies down to like the three-fifths compromise, right? Um, because of that, the air we breathe is racist. And so I always say racism is like a perpetual motion machine. If you do nothing, it will wind up and go by itself. It doesn't need us to do anything. It, it will go, it will perpetuate itself efficiently. That's why the term anti-racism is so important. Basically, racism is systemic, and when we say that, what we mean is it's already baked into the structures, the foundations of how things work, such that the only way to undo it is to actively undo it. I wanna, I wanna end on a question which I'm somewhat obsessed with, which is, I think, a important question of our time, which is, when do you, 
give credence to another person's ideas that you disagree with. There's this, mm -hmm. there's this debate that question. seems to happen, especially since the election, especially on, I think on both sides, which is, I don't agree with you, and, it, and politics is either about compromise or it's about argument, and it's about, okay, you think that and I think this, let's talk about it, let's fight about it. Right. But then there's an argument that says, I'm not even gonna give you the time of day because what you think is not a prescription for solving problems, it's a prescription to keep this group of people oppressed. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know. I think one thing is that, uh, there are multiple layers to this. One is that people who are in positions with marginalized identities have to have these conversations every single day from the time they're born. I got called the N-word for the first time when I was six, okay? I have had to have conversations about race since before, like when I had no front teeth. So some of us have, like, we've had those conversations all the time. And so I think it's fair for people to be like, I don't feel like explaining to you why I'm in a wheelchair. I don't feel like explaining to you why you, I need you to use this pronoun for my gender, right? I think that that's part of it is like, if you're a person that people ask you this stuff all the time, you can be like, I get a pass today. I'm, I'm at Walgreens right now. I just want to buy chapstick. Like, don't talk to me. Well, there's an um, argument which I understand, which says, like, even this interview, does this interview matter? Do, does, yes, do black people to have books. to explain? <laughs> we just have books, Mark. I have student loans, Mark. So yes, it does. It will, it will. Yes. But on a serious yeah. question, like, you, black people don't, you don't have to explain black people to white people. No, but I'm also like, this is like part of my chosen profession. We're not like at the CVS and you're like, right, excuse me, but, CV but I also mess. do, but I do, but yeah. I do, you know, so, so that's part of it is that people could just get tired. And the other thing is that like, if the explaining, like when, when people are like, I just don't believe in like people being gay. It's like, well, if you don't believe in somebody's fundamental identity, that person is not obligated to, that's not really a point of debate. The other, the last thing is, is that uh, sometimes people get in these disagreements and I'm like, you just haven't done any reading. I need you to at least read James Baldwin first before you try to have a, like, I just need you to do some homework. And that's also where it gets, uh, where it gets comical is that people are very much out of their depth um, but they feel like they can engage in a debate where it's like, I just need you to like watch a YouTube video first or something before we can. That's all you're asking. Before, Not even James ask, Baldwin, you know? but it's down to a YouTube video. I want video. you to watch a YouTube video of James Baldwin. There you go. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. <laughs> e viewing, everybody. Thank you. Appreciate you. Thank you.